Well, back in December, in a move that stunned quite a few people, Ram decided to leave the PGA Tour to join Live Golf. In a recent Golf Digest article, a veteran tour insider was quoted as saying the two-time major winners having second thoughts about that move. But that was just one line in a much more expansive piece. And the author of that article is here now, our colleague Jaime Diaz, joining us. Jaime, your thesis for this article had less to do with the idea of whether or not John Rahm is happy with the decision that he's made, but with the broader theme of whether or not players can be trusted to make decisions in, for the good of the game versus their own selfish interest. You didn't seem very optimistic in the story that that <coughs> is actually the case. Well, I think it's an individual case. I mean, not everyone has jumped to live, but certainly the, the temptation of live is so great now. The money is so much exponentially greater than what used to be available outside of the tour or the PGA tour that I think it's just created a different equation in people in players minds and sometimes now uh, money has been chosen over sort of the traditional pursuit of self improvement and greatness in the game for the most talented players and just simply having the stability of the PGA tour not be disrupted by people jumping away. Uh, I think that that now is weighed against gosh generational wealth multi-generational wealth and some players like John decided to take the money um, that has had all kinds of repercussions of course uh, but I don't think the assumption that used to be perhaps when Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer for example could have jumped away and and with Gary Player formed sort of a big three satellite that would have been its own its own mini tour in a way they they had a chance to make more money but they didn't give it really serious consideration probably because in in part the money was not nearly as multiple as it is now, but also I think they felt uh, an obligation to a tour that was still a fledgling tour and not to destroy it. Uh, and, and now I think players feel like the tour is autonomous enough with its own sort of uh, infrastructure that it can handle people leaving. But I think there's a critical mass that at some point it could really not just disrupt the tour, but, but, bring, down, but bring it down completely. I mean, just curious, looking through a historical lens, when the PGA Tour split off from the PGA of America in 1968, were there financial motivations for Arnie and Jack to spearhead that? I don't think so. No, well, yes, in the sense that they thought it'd be a better product and it'd be better run. Their big argument was the PGA of America was not really the ideal sort of administrator for the PGA Tour, and it would be better with its own managers. And so it was a split, basically, to create a business that was going to be more efficient the money was something that they thought would come along with that. But they were getting independent offers to split off and play, you know, exhibitions, play against, you know, what you saw on television, some of those matches, big three golf, make that sort of a permanent part of their um, of their careers. And both Jack and Arnold, and I, I've never talked to Gary about it, but decided, no, that, that, that first of all, was not what they wanted because they wanted to make history, but also was going to be bad for the tour, bad for the collective. Jaime, you talk to some legends about whether or not being wealthy is conducive to seeking out excellence in this game, whether or not it's a motivator or an impediment for guys who are trying to get better. What was the reaction from guys? I mean, you talked to Faldo, you talked to Gary Player on that theme. What, what did you hear from them? Well, in Gary's case, he said, you know, he, he needed money. He didn't grow up rich, but that having money as the sole motivator was not going to be a deep enough kind of uh, passion to do the excellent kind of accomplishments over so many years that he achieved. Uh, Nick was interesting because he definitely wanted to make money at the beginning. That was sort of the motivator. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted the good car. I wanted to fly first class. I wanted to have a good home near Wentworth. But when he, once he got those things, the innate uh, sense of greatness, which, or the desire to be great, which was in there as well, started to get a little bit diluted. It was harder for him to keep the same motivation. Now, he did great things even once he achieved that wealth, but it was harder to sustain it. And, you know, once he won at 96 at the Masters, uh, that sort of fulfilled, I guess, the inner motivations he had for, you know, winning six majors and making history. And it was just harder at that point to bring up what he had when, you know, he was broke uh, as far as the, you know, kind of the urgency to be a great player. I mean, we've had a lot of talks in the newsroom, and I know you're, you're a sports fan as well, beyond just a, a golf fan and a historian who's covered the game for a long time. 
I'm curious, when you look at other sports, like Patrick Mahomes, one of the highest paid players in the NFL, LeBron James, the NBA, Major League Baseball, Shohei Otani gets a massive contract. There's never a concern that with the money, there's going to be this dip in performance when guys are at the peak of their powers. Why is that the case for golf? Well, first, George, you're talking about superstars there who I think are innately motivated to be great. Uh, and there are examples, certainly in the NFL. Oh, he got his big contract. He's not as good anymore. So there's some of that as well. But I, I think really uh, in the team sports, the window is so small for the career. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, five, six years, seven years of prime peak performance with the exceptional guys like LeBron, it's a little longer. But in general, you got to make it while you can. In golf, the career is a lot longer. And so I think when a golfer does it, there's a sense that he sold out something that would have been a, a lucrative 15-year career, 20-year, 25-year career, and more if he wanted to play PGA Tour champions, for example. And so it's, it seems more damaging to the, to the collective at that point to see somebody jump because that, you know, used to be kind of the dream is, is you know, we have a great long career here and, and we need to have unity among our players to keep it going as far as we are presenting the best golf in the world. And when people leave, that hurts the product. And so I think there's more of a, an objection to it from within on the golf tour than there would be, you know, as you know, there were, there were old leagues, AFL, NFL. Uh, and when they merged, uh, that, that ended up being a better product. But that merger was easier to do than this merger is uh, happening, if it ever happens. So, you know, I just think golf's more problematic. And when a player leaves, there's bigger consequences. And all those leagues, we've seen mergers, NBA, ABA in the 70s, AFL, NFL, like you mentioned, Major League Baseball, you had an AL and an NL in the early 1900s that merged together. So uh, to your point, there has been a natural evolution for basically every major North American sports league in which there has been some type of merger. There has, and I'm not saying it won't happen in golf, but look how difficult this one has been. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus, they're not really, it's not really apples to apples, uh, you know, PGA Tour versus Liv. Liv plays a, a completely different product. It's got guaranteed money. Merging those, they're not, you know, AFL, NFL, that was the same game with pretty much the same, maybe not salary structure, but, you know, the same kind of careers as far as the players themselves. The merger was pretty much seamless. Uh, this, this one is not going to be seamless. Uh, same with the ABA and NBA. Uh, was, was fairly seamless, uh, and it improved the product. This, this thing is like, what are the actual parameters going to be if they ever happen, and will the, the nature of co competitive golf change in a way that perhaps will dilute the product? So I think the, the issues are much more problematic and much more complicated. On this idea, Jaime, of golfers having long careers, long lucrative careers, you talked to a former PGA Tour commissioner. Dean Beeman, who seemed to suggest to you in this Golf Digest article that you're going to see players with a lot shorter careers. And as a result of that, it's going to be harder for superstars to emerge. Yeah, Dean had a, a very interesting equation. First, it starts with the nature of the game now, in his opinion anyway. The emphasis on speed uh, has made the younger player more prominent more uh, earlier in his career. He also sort of feels the game is somewhat simpler to play now because of equipment advances and because distance is so important that all the nuances that you kind of learn over time aren't quite as important. Uh, but the other thing is just simply, you know, so, so as a result, players, when they start to lose speed, let's say in their early 30s, they become relatively less competitive than they would be now. And so they will age out faster. That's the theory. And then the other thing, of course, is just the money. The money it will be greater. Uh, the motivation to continue to play will be lessened. The careers will be shorter. The career records won't be as grand. And the traditional measures of greatness won't be measured up to as often. That's his theory. I, I thought it was interesting. I thought uh, it makes a lot of sense as well. I mean, there are two compelling narratives with John Rahm. If you look at what he's done in, in 2024, the, the major season, a bit of a disappointment, slow start until the Open. He had a top 10 finish. If you look at Liv, he's finished top 10 every start. He's had five top threes, just got his first win. He's the leading in points for an in, in, individual right now on the Live Golf Tour. He's at the top of the mountain. You had the quote, obviously, saying that there, potentially there could be some regret with John Rom. Where do you think he is at this point of the year with his decision? 
Well, it's it's so hard to say. It's just a matter of opinion. Again, it's a it, that was a, a qualified, uh, I think, uh, informed opinion that uh, the source in my story, ex uh, and it wasn't an isolated one uh, that uh, you know he uh, he expressed. Uh, I think with John, John has always been known as a passionate player who was very aware of history and wanted to be great and wanted to beat the best players, and he still thrives on that as we saw at the olympics how disappointed he was that was a great stage for him he looked like he was re-energized to a large extent he's played okay on live he's won once he's always top 10 i don't think top 10 on live is considered a great measure of, of you know some, somebody's great uh performance at this moment i think john's still capable obviously of being a great player but he doesn't have the platform and he doesn't have the the sort of uh, palette to kind of paint his his ideal picture right now and so I think it's speculative, but it's especially considering his earlier comments, you know, that, gee, I wish I could still defend my titles uh, from last year early in the season. He said that he said he wished uh, Lib would go to 72 holes. I think it's it's fair to expect. And he also said, you know, I think I could be a tipping point perhaps to a merger that he was hoping for a merger. And now as it's not happening, at least with the, uh, you know, short time frame that it was sort of projected to. It's reasonable to think that, you know, he's he's sorry that's not happening. Uh, I have no evidence firsthand at all that, you know, he wants to go back, anything like that. Even the even the, the quote from the source was a hypothetical that if he could give the money back, I think he would. Uh, we don't really know. But given the anecdotal evidence of his earlier comments and the kind of player we know John to be and his reaction at the Olympics, uh, I just think it's it's natural to wonder if he could do it over again, would he? Do you think it's, it's fair to say, Jaime, that going to live has worked in different ways for different players? Obviously, the jury's still out in terms of John Rahm. It's certainly way too early to suggest, as some people out there are, that it's diminished him as some kind of competitive force, which I don't think is true yet. But you take guys like Kepka and DeChambeau, you could argue that it's actually, it has had no real detrimental impact on them, particularly on Bryson. It might actually have elevated Bryson in some ways. But it's a fundamental issue here. The, these are all guys who still point to major championships as, as the metric by which they want to be measured for their career. And the one thing that Liv does is take away their ability to prepare for those major championships in the manner which they might ideally want. Now, some guys may want to go play Valderrama, the week before the Open Championship. Other guys might actually have liked being on a Lynx course or some guys do want to play in Orlando uh, the week before the Masters. Is that really a, an issue that, that sort of underplayed the idea of that they're kind of hostage to the live schedule and not able to prepare for the tournaments that then measure their legacy? Well, I think it's individual to the player according to how they like to prepare. I think someone like Bryson, who's such a unique kind of uh, approach to the, has such a unique approach to the game. So much of it's on the launch monitor. He doesn't really play that much golf, but he's very obsessed with getting better. The extra time he gets by being a live uh, player, as opposed to the obligations to play a lot, probably help him. I think Brooks has always been so focused on majors that he's always going to get up for majors. But having said that, I think there's an argument that he may not be quite as competitively sharp, even though he never seemed to put a lot of priority on regular events on the PGA Tour, you're still in that milieu where you're around guys who are better than you or playing better than you, and you've got to, you know, you've got to dig dig deep and, and, and keep getting better. I think on Liv, it's easier to coast. Um, he's He seems happy to coast that he did win that PGA, but he hasn't played particularly well since then. I think you look at Cameron Smith and DJ and Patrick Reed, and their performance has fallen way off. Uh, what do you attribute it to? I don't think they've lost their ability either, but they may have lost their motivation. I just think guaranteed money in golf is a softener uh, unless, you're, unless you're someone who's just so innately motivated that it doesn't matter, and I think I don't even know if that person exists. Uh, you know, and having talked to those other players, uh, Pete Cowan, for example, who's worked with so many, he goes, once the money really starts flowing, it's harder to get a player to commit, to focus, with the same intensity and the same passion that he did when he was hungry. Uh, staying hungry is the challenge, and I think Liv makes it harder to stay hungry. 
That I understand. I would push back. I mean, Brooks Kepko won a major last year. Bryson DeChambeau won a major this year. If the season ended right George, now. I wasn't arguing against Bryson. But if the and, season and ended I'm not, right now, John Rahm would be Live Golf Player of the Year. So I, I get the, the emphasis on the number of victories, and that's how we measure the greats. But he's the leading point getter. So for his performance through Live, he's been the best of anyone on that tour this season. Well, it's all relative to how, how highly you rate Live. I don't, I don't consider their golf. Uh, as challenging as the PGA Tour, and I, gosh, uh, I'm probably getting in trouble for this saying this. I, I'd like to see a Corn Ferry All Star game against a Live All Star game, <laughs> or, or you know, 20 guys, uh, 20 guys deep, and you know, I, I wonder how that would go. But who knows? Uh, you know, but I just don't think that Live uh, just presents the same standard week to week. And if you want to extrapolate from that, uh, it probably would mean that there's an edge that PGA Tour players have that Live players don't. I know, I know uh, Brooks won that major, and, and Bro- but Brooks didn't always exhibit that edge on the PJ Tour, admittedly. Majors have made you know, his career. He's, he's incredible, and he's a historical player as a result. But is he arguably as prepared as he used to be for majors? Uh, looking at his record, it's such a small sample, but I think there's an argument that he's not.